So on to the thyroid hormone, we're going to talk about thyroid development first, a little bit of embryology. So the thyroid gland arises as an outpouching of the pharynx out here at the top of the tongue at the foramen cecum, and it's going to descend down into the neck. It's going to do so along the thyroglossal duct. It's going to descend down the neck until where it would normally reside and rest um, above the trachea. However, this you can have failure of this descent of the thyroid. And what's going to happen is it's going to lead to the thyroid developing anywhere along the thyroglossal duct. So let's say it stops descending here. So you're going to get thyroid tissue here instead of here. And the other thing, you can also just not descend at all, and you can just have thyroid tissue around the tongue. And that's something we would call a lingual thyroid. So the thing to know about the lingual thyroid is sometimes this can be the only thyroid tissue in the body. So there's no other tissue in the body making thyroid hormone except for this tissue, this thyroid tissue that you see in the, around the tongue. And the thing is that we like to remove this lingual thyroid. So unfortunately, if we remove it and there's no other tissue making thyroid hormone, this patient's going to develop significant hypothyroidism. So that's when you'll be, you want to be careful about, about that. And also, if you see a question that tells you, I mean, this patient has all these symptoms of hypothyroid, and they had their lingual thyroid removed, then you probably know what's going on. Now, the other thing to know is that the most common form of a congenital cyst in the neck is a thyroglossal duct cyst, because this thyroglossal duct is going to persist in children, and it can pouch pouch out and cut and become present as a cyst. So this is what it's going to look like. It's a neck mass, and it's going to be anterior and midline. It's anterior midline neck mass. It's a thyroglossal duct cyst. And I emphasize that location because the the one you want to be able to separate it out from is a branchial cleft cyst. And a branchial cleft cyst will be here in the lateral part of the neck. So lateral part of the neck mass is branchial cleft cyst. Anterior midline neck mass is a thyroglossal duct cyst, and it's going to move when you swallow. Which is, if you remember the thyroid examiner, the thyroid will also move up when you swallow. Okay, so let's, we're gonna, let's switch on, jump gears into thyroid hormone synthesis. So what's going to happen, well first of all, this is the circulation, this is thyroid cells, thyroid follicular cells, and the thyroid follicular lumen. I want to draw this out for you in a different way so you understand what I'm talking about. This is what you see on histology. You're going to see all these thyroid cells, and this is the lumen here. And then you, what we see here is we have these blood vessels around it. So this thyroid cell is going to take up iodide from the circulation. It's going to take it up and then it's going to send it all the way into the thyroid follicular lumen and it's going to oxidize it into iodine. Okay. So one, step one, take up of iodide. Step two, oxidation into iodine. So I2. Next, step three is iodination. That means that you're going to take this iodine and you're going to couple it the tyrosine residues on the thyroglobulin. So it's iodination of the tyrosine residues on the thyroglobulin. So basically, the two, one iodine re residue with the thyroglobulin is going to make MIT. This is monoiodotyrosine. If you get two iod iodines, you get diiodotyrosine. So it's DIT. So you get DIT and MIT. Okay, now step four is going to be called coupling. That's coupling of the MITs and the DITs. So if you get an MIT and a DIT, that's 1 plus 2. D is die for 2, so you get T3. And if you get two DITs, that's 2 plus 2, you get T4. So that's coupling, coupling of the MITs and the DITs. So now you have T3 and T4 stuck on the, thyro on the thyroglobulin. Now your thyroid cell is going to engulf it and take it back in, in, in into lysosomes. And then the lysosomes are going to digest this thyroglobulin. They're going to kick out the T3 and T4 into the circulation. And you're going to be able to recycle these, these, iodide, these iodide residues, this MIT and the DIT. And then now you have, you have your thyroid hormone that's going to go out into circulation uh, from the thyroid, from the thyroid gland. It's going to go into circulation and cover all of the body. So just to re recap everything, thyroid hormone synthesis, couple steps. Take up of iodide oxidation into iodine, iodination, so iodine joins tyrosine residues, you get MIT and DIT, 
and then you get coupling of the MITs and the DITs making the T3 and T4 on the thyroglobulin still. Then it's taken up, so that's, I guess that would be step five, is take up into the thyroid cells, and then you're going to kick out the, the thyroid hormone, and you're going to recycle the iodine. So what is the function of this thyroid hormone that we just talked about? So this hormone, like I said, acts on pretty much every organ in the body. It's made in the thyroid, goes into the blood, acts on every organ in the body. And the function, the very, very main function is control of the body basal metabolic rate. And the way it controls basal metabolic rate is by increasing oxygen consumption as well as energy consumption. And it's going to do that by increasing the sodium potassium ATPase activity. So you use, use up ATP, so you're using up energy. And to, and to replenish that energy, you're going to have to consume oxygen and to oxidative phosphorylation and make energy. And doing all this is oxygen consumption is going to lead to heat generation with increased body temperature. So that's the main function of thyroid hormone is body basal metabolic rate. Next, it's going to increase blood glucose. And why would we need to do that? Because like I just told you, we're using all this energy. We need an energy source, so we need to increase blood glucose. And when you, we're going to see changes in blood glucose and regulation of blood glucose a lot. We're going to see things, hormones that increase blood glucose and hormones that decrease it. And the way you can um, alter this is through gluconeogenesis. glycogenolysis, lipolysis, and uh, breakdown of proteins or buildup of proteins. So when you break this stuff down, you're going to break it down into and then eventually form glucose. So to increase blood glucose, what you're going to need to do is you're going to have to increase gluconeogenesis, that's making glucose. Uh, you're going to have to increase glycogenolysis so you're going to break down the glycogen into glucose lipolysis you want to break down fat so that you can take those building blocks and make glucose you're also going to break down protein so this is a catabolic state that we're at we're breaking down stuff into so that we can make glucose next is increased sympathetic nervous system now why would we want that? What is how does the sympathetic nervous system affect cardiac output? Remember that it would increase cardiac output, and this makes sense. We're using all this oxygen consumption, so we need more oxygen to our tissues. So one way we can do that is we can increase cardiac output and increase delivery of blood and oxygen to all the tissues in our body. And so remember, what was the receptor that was in the heart that it allows you to do this? Remember, the heart has the beta one receptors that it increases cardiac output to make up for the increased oxygen demand. So other functions include working with growth hormone to increase growth and bone formation, and then finally maturation of the CNS, the central nervous system. So the thyroid hormone is essential for normal maturation during the perinatal period, which is around when the baby's born. It is essential for normal maturation. So if you have low thyroid levels, so if you have hypothyroidism in the baby at this point, you can have um, basically messed up maturation of the central nervous system it's going to lead to permanent men, permanent mental retardation so again main function control of the body basal metabolic rate these two things support this by increasing by providing energy and oxygen and the thyroid hormone also responsible for growth and bone formation as well as maturation of the cns so next we're going to talk about a little bit about the thyroxine binding globulin tbg so this binds to T3 and T4 in the blood. And the key thing to note is when this T3 and T4 is bound, it's inactive. It doesn't work. Okay. So what will increase TBG production? TBG production is increased in states of high estrogen. And what would these states be? We see this over and over again, states of high estrogen. You see it increases TBG, as you can see, increases clotting risk, things like that. So what would it be? So S for pregnancy is one example. OCP use is another example. Really, you don't have to memorize this. Is you just have to be able to recognize these. These are states that cause high estrogen. So, if, you, if you're uh, taking um, contraceptives, you're going to have increased TBG, TBG synthesis, increased bound T3 and T4. Stuff that causes decrease in TBG. Well, TBG is a protein, so stuff that decreases protein synthesis and decreases proteins in general. So, hepatic failure and steroid use. We see this again. We see this over and over again. We see that this decreases protein synthesis, 
Remember, um, proteins are made in the liver and steroids, that's what they do. They decrease protein synthesis. And then nephrotic syndrome. What was nephrotic syndrome? Well, nephrotic syndrome was a problem with increased cap um, glomerular permeability. So now you're going to have, have proteins leaking into the glomerulus and the kidneys are going to be excreted in the urine. So you're going to be peeing out all this protein, including TBG. So you're going to have decreased TBG. Now, you might be thinking... If, if a person is taking oral contraceptives, they're having increased TBG synthesis, wouldn't they become hypothyroid? Because now they have uh, so much bound T3 and T4, and I told you it's inactive. And the reason why this is not the case is because of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So transiently, yes, we do increase TBG synthesis, and thus we have uh, decreased active T3 slash T4. But what's going to happen is you're going to have your hypothalamic pituitary axis. And normally this stuff, remember, this stuff has inhibition, feedback inhibition. But we just, like I said, we decrease this stuff, this active stuff, because there's more, there's less unbound T3 and T4. So you have decreased feedback inhibition, you have activation of TRH, activation of TSH. They're going to stimulate the thyroid to make more T3 and more T4 until eventually your levels of unbound and active thyroid hormone reaches the normal level, which is why persons taking an oral contraceptive are going to have normal thyroid levels, normal active thyroid levels, but they would have increased bound thyroid because there's going to be increased TBG synthesis. So now let's talk about what happens when you have too much or too little of thyroid hormone. So when you have too much, what you're going to get is you're going to get hyperthyroidism. This is a this is a uh, like a clinical picture it's a bunch of symptoms that you can get and it all relates to the functions of thyroid hormone that i just told you about so what I, what did i tell you was the very main function of thyroid hormone remember it was to increase metabolic activity and thus increase heat generation so if you have too much thyroid hormone too much metabolic activity what you're going to see is you're going to see heat intolerance and sweating so this patient is going to just be, in a normal temperature room they're going to feel very hot they're going to feel sweaty they're going to be very uncomfortable you're going to have weight loss room, which is burning all that energy, using up all the ATP. So you're going to be losing weight, and you're going to have warm and moist skin, again, from heat, from temperature generation, you're going to have dilate, vasodilation. And then going along with the warm and moist skin, you're going to have fine hair. So this is all from metabolic activity. Now, what, it, what, was, what was another function of thyroid hormone? When the next one I told you about was glucose control, which we're not going to talk about here. But the other one was sympathetic stimulation. So if you, if you have too much thyroid hormone, you're going to get sympathetic overstimulation. And symptoms you're going to see include uh, diarrhea, hyperactivity, restlessness, anxiety, and you're going to get tachycardia. Remember, what was the receptor on the heart for this, for thyroid hormone? Remember, it was the B1, beta-1 receptor. So this is all sympathetic stimulation. Now, a couple other symptoms we're going to see include oligomenorrhea and decreased libido and fertility, and you have increased deep tendon reflexes. And finally, in Graves, so there's a couple of, couple of causes of hyperthyroidism. The main cause that you want to know about is Graves' disease. And Graves' disease is going to have pretibial mixed edema and Graves' ophthalm, ophthalmopathy. So pretibial mixed edema, so that's basically swelling right behind the tibia, which remember are the lower legs. So there's swelling there and Graves of the of the what, what what this means is basically periorbital edema and exophthalmos. And I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to show you exophthalmos. This is this. It's protrusion of the eyeballs. It's because there's going to be increased volume right behind the eyeballs and the tissue behind it. So you get exophthalmos, and that's that's what you see in Graves' disease. So let's go back here. And so what are going to be your lab values and hyperthyroidism? What's going to be your TSH levels here? Well, first of all, to answer that, your T3 and T4 levels are going to be increased because this is hyperthyroidism. So what's going to happen is they're going to feed back and inhibit TSH. So you're going to have decreased TSH levels. So decreased TSH, level, TSH levels are very characteristic of hyperthyroidism thanks to that feedback inhibition. The other thing you want to know is that there's going to be decreased lipid and cholesterol levels in general. Next, hypothyroidism. You don't even have to memorize anything, pretty much. You only have to feel things to memorize because pretty much everything is the opposite. So whatever you see here, you just make it the opposite, and you know the answer.
So for example, you're going to get cold intolerance, you're going to get decreased sweating. So cold intolerance means in a normal temperature room, this patient's going to be, feel freezing, they're going to want a jacket, they're just going to be uncomfortable as well. So all pretty much opposite. The one thing I want to point out is this one, the hair, because it's not completely opposite, but you get coarse, brittle hair instead of fine hair. This one is, I want to point out again, because it's not opposite here. In, in this case, it's actually the same. So you get oligomenorrhea, decreased libido, and infertility. Finally, here, instead of just the pretibial mixed edema and the ophthalmopathy with exophthalmos, what you see in hypothyroidism is a generalized mixed edema. The generalized edema, and this happens from deposition of glycosaminoglycans in the skin and the soft tissue. Okay, so again, everything is the same. The ones you want to memorize are the hair are a little different. This is the same thing, and then this is different. And honestly, this is kind of low. This is not going to help you answer the question. This is not going to help you answer the question. This could help you. This is very characteristic of Graves' disease. Um, and finally, lab values. What are the TSH levels here going to be? And then what are the T3, T4 levels? Obviously, this is going to be low. And then there's going to have decreased feedback inhibition, so these are going to be increased. And that makes sense. You want increased TSH to stimulate the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone when you have a pro the whole problem is when you have too little thyroid hormone. And again, more opposites here. You have decreased cholesterol here, you have increased cholesterol here. So that's our overview of that's a part one introduction of the thyroid gland, uh, production of thyroid hormone, and then functions, and then what happens when it goes wrong. And now next couple of lectures are going to talk about causes of hyperthyroidism. So I only talked about this, the clinical syndrome and picture. There's, there's a few causes of this. There's a lot of causes of hypothyroidism. We're going to get into that in the next lectures.